chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. This will be the fourth lesson in this series entitled Looking Unto Jesus. You know, I, I, there, there are several illustrations in the scriptures concerning the importance of keeping our, our thoughts and our, uh, the eye of faith turned exclusively to the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I've mentioned one in particular when we think about Peter uh, and him being bidden. He asked our Lord, if it's you, remember when our Lord came to the apostles while they were out in the ship and the storm had came, the storm being sent on purpose by our God. And, you know, that, that, that's the thing that, that we're getting into here in Hebrews chapter 12 is that trial and tribulation and persecution that arises over the word it's for our growth in grace and knowledge of the truth. Now, we don't like it. and Many times we don't understand it. But the only way faith grows is faith has to be exercised. It has to be tried. It has to be tested. And so Peter bids our Lord, if it's you, bid me come, unto the, come to you on the water. And our Christ said, come on. And Peter stepped out of the boat, began to walk on the water. And as long as he had his eyes firmly fixed on Christ, everything was fine. But the moment he took his eyes off the Lord Jesus Christ, what happened? Immediately he began to sink. He didn't lose his salvation. <laughs> you know, I, I, I've heard men try to teach that. Is that that's what that he was in, in danger of losing everything. The worst thing could have happened was our Lord let him drown. He might have lost his physical life, but he could not lose that which had been purchased or would be purchased through Christ's accomplished death at Calvary. And it's the same for you and me as justified saints. And that's, that's one of the things that we have to keep in mind. And yeah, we, we, we stressed it so much through Hebrews chapter 11, and we continue to stress it. You know, for 11 full chapters in this book, he has assured these men and women who have truly rested in Christ as the Lord their righteousness, have uh, by God-given faith, embraced him as their savior, their redeemer, their substitute, their surety, that there is no possibility, no matter what the trial, what the circumstance, what the failure, what the sin, nothing can take us away from him. We are, as he said in Hebrews chapter 10, and we have to, we have to understand this, he's perfected forever them that believe. So we're talking about, we're not talking about people that are on the verge of, True believers are on the verge of losing their salvation. Nothing could be further from the truth. Nothing could be more of a denial of Christ's person and the work that he was sent to do when he came into this world. These believers were experiencing exactly what our Lord Jesus Christ taught about in the Sermon on the Mount. It is exactly the thing that the Apostle Paul stressed to those Galatia, the Philippian believers, those Gentile believers at Philippi, when he told them and told you and me, because we're Gentiles as well, that unto you it's been given on the behalf of Christ not only to believe on his name, but here's the thing, to suffer for his name's sake. These Hebrews were suffering for his name's sake. Both the elect justified saints and those who had professed that Christ was the Lord their righteousness. Now, many do that. I mean, it's tragic, but it's true. How many have we seen in our lifetime that started out claiming Christ is the Lord their righteousness? And I, I, I want to be very careful here. I, don't, I, don't, I, I hold out hope that though they might not be among us anymore, that they're still God's children, that they're still redeemed, that they're still justified sinners, that they're not mere professors of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, but those who have truly been purchased of God, just falling away. Not falling away permanently, but backslidden. Falling into a place of indifference, separation, not using the means that God has given uh, to his children for their growth in grace and knowledge of the truth. Now, you used to immediately, I guarantee you, if you missed four or five Sundays, old Richard would have wrote you off. And I'm thankful that it ain't got nothing to do with what old Richard says. You know, I'm not your judge. It's God that justified. And I'll tell you this much, everybody he justified, every one of them, 
there is safe and secure is the one who did to justify him. Keep that in mind. I know people don't like to talk about it. Religious people, particularly those who are moralists, they don't like to acknowledge it. But listen, there is no depths to where a child of God can get themselves into a sin. And that's not making excuse. And I, that's, not, that's not giving you a way out to where you can say, well, Brother Richard said that there's, there's nothing that I can't do. <laughs> well, the reality is there's nothing that you can't do. And the thing is, but for the grace of God, every one of us in here would do exactly the things that are contrary to God. He's, got to, he's the one who's able to keep us from falling, not ourselves. Nonetheless, those that are his, and that's what he's going to get to in this chapter as we move on through it. Every child of God, everyone that Christ suffered, bled, died, redeemed by his obedience unto death. You know what he does? He chastens them. Doesn't punish them. Our punishment's done. Now get that right. You and I, those objects of God's eternal love, those men and women, elect sinners, redeemed, justified, sanctified, guaranteed that they'll finally ultimately be glorified, they cannot lose what they have been given in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's impossible. But every one of them, if, if, if we go astray, what does the Lord do? He chastens us. Doesn't punish us because he punished us where? In Christ. All the guilt, all the penalty, all the condemnation of all my sins fell on him. Past, present, and future. All of them. People say, well, I don't, that's just, that's. That, that invites a man or woman to live like hell. No, it doesn't. It falls back under this parameter. We love him because he first loved us. If you ever see him who loved you to the point that he gave, he, listen, he gave up his soul unto death. Not just his humanity, his soul suffered death. I can't explain that. We ever get a glimpse at by God given faith of that, you will never use anything as an excuse to sin against your God. You certainly will never use anything in the scriptures or anything about grace to justify bad behavior. You just won't. Now, we want to pick up this morning here. We'd, we'd started looking at verse 2. And we want to continue to look at how. Looking unto Jesus, because this is the important part of it, looking unto a Jesus, we are equipped and we are enabled to live in this present evil world. Apart from looking to Christ, we'll fail every time. Now we will. Last time we saw that, that Christ, now notice what he says, looking unto Jesus, and here's all we covered last week, the author and finisher of and you see our is in italics, the author and finisher of faith. Now hold your place there and look. turn over to a very familiar passage of Scripture. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2. And think about this word faith in light of the way Paul uses it. Here in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 and 9. And in consideration that the Lord Jesus Christ is the author and finisher of faith. Now notice what he says. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8. For by grace are you saved. Now how are we saved? By grace. But there's a means. There's a means. What's the mean? Through faith. Faith here, same faith that Christ is the author and finisher of. I mean, keep that in mind. And that, faith, now, now, a lot of people try to make that as a reference to grace. It's not a reference back to grace. It's a reference to what? To the faith that's the gift of God. That not of yourself. In other words, it, here's the thing. Men can believe a lot of things. My stars, 
James put it like this. The devils believe and tremble. I've asked you so many times over the last 36 plus years, how many devils are there going to be in heaven? So whatever faith is here, it's not something that you perform. It's not part of you. It's not something that's in you by nature. The ability to believe that the earth is round or that there's a sky above me or that I am breathing or you're breathing or that there's life after death. We can believe these kind of things. So does everybody else. Men by nature believe it's better to go to church than not go to church. And that's true. We all believe that. Better to, to, to not murder than to murder. It's better to not commit adultery than to commit adultery. It's better to not steal or lie or cheat than it is to do the others. Everybody believes that. But this faith, which is a gift of God, allows us to look beyond just these things that everybody can agree upon and believe in and, and testify of. It allows us to see that even if we don't steal, if we don't lie, if we don't cheat, if we don't commit adultery, if we do love God as, as men command us to love, none of it, none of it equals a righteousness by which God can be just to justify you. That's not in you by nature. By nature, all of us think that if before, before true faith comes into our life, this gift of God comes to us in regeneration and conversion, all of us think that our performance either shows our salvation or our lost condition. Is that, can we agree on that? Faith enables to, to look where? To the one who's the author and finisher of it. You justify, you said you're saved by grace. Through faith, and that not of yourself, the gift of God. Not of works. In other words, works doesn't play into this thing. Everybody, everybody gets so hung up on works, good works. Even a lot of good authors that I read a lot, they, they got a lot to say about good works. But here's the thing. Define good works for me. In light of what the scripture says, there's none that doeth good, no dot one. Tell me what a good work is. In light of what Paul said in Romans, I know that in me that is in my flesh dwells no good thing. To will is present with me. In other words, I know what I should do, but I don't find the power to do it. So he says, not of works. He clarified, not of works. Why? Because here's the problem. If it's of works, what will we do? Lest any man should do what? Boast. And what our Lord said of the scribes and Pharisees when he told that parable of the, the, the uh, uh, publican and the sinner. He spoke this parable to this end that those who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Now, how did they trust in themselves that they were righteous? Hmm? How did you trust in yourself that you were righteous before God revealed that you had none of your own? Now, keep that in mind. Now, go back over to our text. This faith of which the Lord Jesus Christ is the author, and I told you last week, what's an author? It means he's the captain of faith or he's the prince of faith. And he's the finisher of faith, which I told you this last week, but I'll tell you again. It means he's the perfecter of faith. Or a better definition is this, one who has in his, in his own person raised faith to its perfection. So the only one that has raised faith to its perfection, who is it? It's not you or me. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. And folks, it's that faith, that one that Christ perfected by his obedience unto death, it's the gift of God to all those chosen by God the Father in the everlasting covenant of grace. And so the writer tells us why. 
Now, this is so, why should we consider him? Why should we look unto Jesus? Well, he tells us. Look at our text. Look at the second part of verse 2. Who for the joy that was set before him. You know, I'm 60, fixed to turn 65 years. That's a ain't good southern word. It fix. I'm about to turn 65 years of age. Our Lord Jesus Christ lived only 33 years. And the scriptures tell us that all 33 years, what was he considered? A man of sorrows. Born in a humble beginning. King of kings and Lord of lords, but born in a borrowed manger. Wrapped in swathing clothes. Grew up a meager life, obedient to his father and his mother. And when he began his ministry, he was, he was never loved and embraced, but what? Hated, rejected, ridiculed, and ultimately put to death. And he came here for that express purpose. Could you envision that? Born into this life. Knowing that everything about your life, from your first breath to your last breath, was about accomplishing one particular purpose. That that's all my life's about. It wouldn't, it wouldn't bring me much joy, would it you? But this, what did it do to him? Huh? The joy that was, he knew when he was born, what was he going to do? He knew all along from the time that that humanity came into existence. Actually, we could trace it back further to that. He was the eternal God, the everlasting Father, from how long? When it was just Father, Son, and Spirit in eternity past. And God, at Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever, He's always known what, his, what, what was to occur in that humanity that He would be placed into be in, in, incarnating gave him no grief no sorrow though he did experience sorrow as a man it was a joy to him this joy you know what it is Look, hold your place there turn over to John 17 this joy is threefold First one is this. The joy that was set before him was his father's glory. Christ, didn't he say, I always do the will of the father. Notice what he says here. And this is in his priestly prayer, John 17, verse 4. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work that you gave us me to do. So the first thing that he considered as the joy was what? That everything that he did by way of his perfect obedience and his obedient death, what did it do? It glorified the Father. You know, I, when I think about glorification, and I, and I think about the glory of God, because that's what glorification is. I always come back to that same point when Moses was before the Lord and he said, if I found grace in your eyes, show me your glory. And God said, I'll do this thing that you've requested. I'll show you my glory. And he, and I think it's Exodus 34, that's Exodus 33, and Exodus 34, God hid him in the cleft of the rock and it said that the Lord stood on the rock and declared the name of the Lord. That's his glory. What's the glory of God? His name. What's his name? Here's his name. I'll have mercy on whom I'll have mercy, and I'll have compassion on whom I'll have compassion. Now, that's his glory. Now, the scriptures answer how he can do that. He doesn't just do it indiscriminately. What does he have to do? For him to have mercy and to have compassion, what does he have to do? He has to have satisfaction. And so the satisfaction is what? The only one that can satisfy God is who? 
See, that, I think that's one of the things that's lost by in, in unregenerate mind. Well, it's not lost. It just can't be comprehended by the unregenerate mind. They think somehow another creature down here can do something that would satisfy an eternal God. The only thing that can satisfy one who is eternal must itself be what? Eternal. So he saw in his work, his accomplishment, as God-man mediator, that who would be glorified? God the Father would be exalted in his covenant relationship to his people as a just God who will by no means clear the guilty and yet at the same time a Savior. But here's the second thing. Here's the second thing that he that uh, the goal of this joy that's set before him, his own preeminence and his own exaltation. Christ said, and, and I, if I be lifted up, I be exalted to the point of pinnacles, I think that's the word, <laughs> to the highest point, what happens? The I, if I be lifted up, will draw all to me. Look here at verse 5, John 17. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with, with thine own self. Glorify thou me with thine own self. With the, listen, with the glory which I had with you before the world began. Religious people think somehow or another that this work of salvation and redemption somehow makes Christ more glorious. Uh -huh. What our Lord say right here? What glories he want to be glorified with? Not anything that he's done down here, but what? With the essential glory he had is who? Do you realize that when this is all over, said and done, we are going to be, as God's elect, his redeemed sons and daughters, we are going to be the beneficiaries of eternal bliss. But it is not going to change this God one iota. He's the same. Unchanged. And that makes me grateful. How about you? That he, he's not changed by any of it. Here's the third thing. The full, free, eternal salvation of all those the Father had given him. Look over at John chapter 6. Look at verse 35. John 6, 35. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He that comes to me, which that's the same as believing. He that comes to me shall never hunger. And he that believeth on me shall never thirst. But I said unto you that you also have seen me and you believe not. All that the Father giveth me, what do they do? Notice it, make the connection. I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. And he that believeth on me shall never thirst. And here he tells us who's going to come. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And he said, now I always do the Father's will. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which sees the Son believes on him, and they have everlasting life, and I will raise him up. At the last day. And listen to me. These three goals that was the joy set before our Lord Jesus Christ are inseparable. Christ is our substitute and our mediator and our surety. Where is he at right now? He is exalted and sits at the right hand of the majesty on high because he has revealed and he has honored every perfection of God's character in saving sinners. And see, th this was the goal of Christ's humiliation. This was the goal of his suffering. This was the goal of his death. And this goal that was always before his mind enabled him to endure the cross, including everything that led up to his death. That's the joy. That's why he could, 
half people. I mean, I think about it. I can't think of anything, well, the, everything that was involved with our Lord Jesus Christ is just contemptible, all of it. But to me, one of the, I, I mean, I, I'm pretty sure the cat of tine tails would be a bad thing, but could you envision people spitting on you? And they spat on our Lord Jesus Christ, and you know what he did? What, he never said a word. Let somebody spit in our face. Huh? You will see how good you are? Let somebody, it, let it be your best friend, the best person that you are closest to. Let them get angry at you this afternoon and let them spit in your face, and let's see where that goes to. Oh, that's, that's so lovely. <laughs> I love you, and I forgive you. Oh, no, no, we got a problem, right? Our Lord Jesus Christ never said a word. I was thinking about this this week. This probably this would get this banned from Facebook. I'm going to tell you what. A lot of people of a lot of different races are now trying to promote the idea that our Lord Jesus Christ was some kind of social justice warrior. I want to call that what it is. That is an absolute lie. You think about our Lord Jesus Christ. When injustice was done to him, what did he do? Did he write? Did he pick up a banner? Did he start an organization? Did he try to get people to join him in it? What did he do? When, when he was railed against, what did he do? He never said a word. He never said a word. How are we told to suffer? Get what's rightfully yours. Well, I deserve this. All, all these people, well, we deserve this and we deserve that. i tell you what we all deserve. Including our forefathers that you and I had nothing to do with hundreds of years ago. And when, when, when you look at slavery today, I think it was contemptible. It was wrong. It was evil. It was vile. But how, how can we be held accountable for that? But listen to me. The ones that had the slaves and the ones that were the slaves, they both were in the same condition before the true and living God. They both needed the same deliverance, didn't they? Joseph was a slave. I don't know how many years he was in sl a mistreated slave. And he just bid his time. Trusting himself into the hands of his Lord. Here's the next thing. Despising the shame. Turn back over to our text. This phrase despising the shame denotes that compared to his threefold goal. The shame involved in his state of humiliation. You know what? It was nothing. It was nothing. Now when we consider his shame, which is beyond our comprehension... How much more valuable is the goal? Because he had to go through it. Because listen, everything that he suffered through is what you and I rightfully deserve. And see, as long as we continually rejoice that God has placed us in an unchangeable state of justification based on an unchangeable righteousness of Christ, our affections will be set on our God as our Savior. And this, this is what looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, is all about. What, think about it. Look at verse 3. What, what are our sufferings, what are your sufferings, what are my sufferings compared to Christ? For consider him, that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your mind. We all of us have a woe-me complex, don't we? The worst thing I've ever suffered in my life doesn't even begin to compare with what this person went through, the Lord Jesus Christ. Because here's the thing. He didn't deserve any of it. You and I deserve all of it. This person was holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners. Right? 
This person never thought an evil thought. I, I can't, as, as God man, never thought an evil thought, never did an evil deed, always did the will of the Father, always was obedient to the law in its entirety, every jot and every tittle from his birth until his death. You think all of his suffering, they were for us. As our substitute and our surety. We've already seen that as we've gone through the book of Hebrews. It was, it was necessary that if he was going to be our faithful high priest, what did he have to endure? He had to endure everything that we endure. He had to be able to identify with us. You think about it, there's not one temptation that you and I have ever encountered that our Lord Jesus Christ didn't deal with. Not one. And here's the thing. Can we deny him or our testimony for him when we consider this? Because he, he, he tells us here that consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners in, in, against himself, lest you be wearied. Makes it personal. You be weird and faint in your minds because what's happening here? Some of these Hebrew believers were on the verge of departing. But you've got to consider this as well. There were some who were true children of God that were weary and about to faint. Didn't mean they were going to lose their salvation. You and I as justified saints, don't we get overrun? In our hearts and in our minds and our understanding, overwhelmed by our remaining sinfulness? And our failure to love our God and to love our neighbor, which includes our worst enemy as ourselves. And see, the way that believers become uh, weary is to faint in your mind. What's the remedy? Faith, of which Christ is the author and finisher. Because you think about the true faith of God's elect, it stirs up and it gauges every one of the subjective graces that's given to us. Courage, resolution, patience, prayer, joy, and peace in the midst of the affliction. Look over at 2 Peter chapter 1. Look at verse 2. 2 Peter 1, verse 2. Oh, let's back up and read verse 1 as well. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained, what have they obtained? Like precious faith. Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of faith. What have we obtained? We have obtained like precious faith with us. How did we obtain it? Through our good works, through our morality, through our faithfulness, through our purpose. No, through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So where's the emphasis to be? On the righteousness of God, our Savior, and His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what he's been talking about, looking unto Jesus. Peter understood it. Grace and peace to you be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. According as his divine power hath given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and to virtue. Now look at this list. Whereby are given unto us exceeding and great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. And that, that word partakers there means be in fellowship. It's the same word that's used when John used it over in 1 John. Uh, he, he made this statement. He said, uh, That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. 
So he's talking about how we fellowship with God. He's not talking about we get some divine, sinless nature imparted into us that enables us or that it itself does not and will not and cannot sin. That's not what he's talking about here. And have escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And besides this, now we've been given exceeding great and precious promises. He says, besides this, giving all diligence. In other words, this ought to be our last work. Add to your faith virtue. And to virtue, knowledge. And to knowledge, temperance. And to temperance, patience. And to patience, godliness. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, charity. Well, those are the things we're to do. Now notice what he says next. For if these things be in you and abound, that, you, that they make you that you are neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. What's the flip side of that? If those things are not abounding, what will you be? You'll be f fruitless in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, it, it, it won't give you comfort. Can't give you assurance. Can't give you peace of mind. Again, we see that, that looking unto Jesus is satisfying all the conditions of our salvation. It's the remedy that's proposed to us. Look to Christ. It's the remedy proposed to lost sinners. Where do we tell sinners to look? Look to Christ. Look to him as the Lord your righteousness. I, that's not an offer. I'm not saying if you would look to Jesus. I'm telling you, Christ has satisfied law and justice on behalf of everybody whom he represented. Look to it. And listen, lost sinners are commanded by our God. And fully wanted to believe God's promise of salvation condition on the Lord Jesus Christ and to confess and admit of their former idolatry and their dead works. It's the remedy proposed to save sinners, to justified saints. It's the only thing that will cause us to persevere to the end, knowing that we, before we take that first step by way of obedience, what do we already possess? We possess all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus without the deeds of the law. Now we've seen so far in this epistle how the writer continues to encourage believers to persevere in the gospel, notwithstanding all the, the, the suffering that they called upon to endure. And here's the thing, the only way we can endure suffering, the only way we can endure persecution over the gospel is to have our hearts established with grace. We have to be convinced that we're sure and certain for heaven based on Christ's righteousness, and we also have to be equally convinced that all those that seek salvation in any other way other than through the blood and righteousness of the very obedience unto death are eternally condemned. And that's what enables us to continue in the faith and to not compromise the gospel. Notice what he says in verse 4. You have not resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Christ did. You see that? We're looking unto Jesus. But he says, you have not suffered to the point that you shed blood over it. Our Lord Jesus Christ did. Literally, this verse translated is, you have not resisted to the point of shedding your blood and your strivings against sin. And folks, th this is particularly sin that we're to strive against. Strive to the point of blood. What, the sin of denying the gospel in order to gain relief from persecution and suffering. I wrote this into my notes this week. That, that, that idea here, you have not resisted unto blood striving against sin, brought to my mind the, the parable of the sower when our Lord explained the parable of the sower and the seed. And when he was interpreted, he talked about the stony ground here. And listen to this. But he that hath received the seed into stony places, the same is he that heareth the word, and anon, immediately with joy, what do they do? They receive it. I know people like that. 
Yet because they have not root in themselves. What is that? They have no faith. That faith which is a gift of God, it endures for a while. For when, here, listen, for when tribulation and persecution ariseth because of the word, what happens? By and by, he or she is offended and they go away. See, this, this striving is resisting every attempt made to influence us to compromise the gospel. Striving against compromise, you know what it might result in? It might result in our death if God didn't restrain sinners. Remember, they, they crucified our Lord Jesus Christ not over his walk, his character, and his conduct. What did they crucify him for? His doctrine, what he preached. And his doctrine, what did it do? It exposed their idolatry and it excluded everything, every false refuge that they held value. He told these lost religious sinners in his day that their deeds were evil and that they were doing dead works. In John 7, he told his brothers, physical brothers, that he encouraged him, go up to Jerusalem for the Feast of the Tabernacles. A, t a feast instituted by God under the law. And he said to them, the world cannot, you going up, the world cannot hate you, but me it hates because what? I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. That's John 7, 7. That word translated testify means to bear witness or to bear honorable testimony. So here's the question. What did Christ bear honorable testimony of that infuriates the world's hatred toward him, that the works thereof are evil. That word, the works, means the business or the employment, that which one undertakes to do. Enterprise, undertaking. That word translated evil means, listen to this, this is, this is unique. You know what the word evil means? Full of labors, annoyances, hardships. It's the same word our Lord Jesus Christ used here in Matthew chapter 11. Come to me all ye that labor, heavy laden. To give us some context, it's the same word our Lord Jesus Christ used to Nicodemus, when he spoke to Nicodemus, a religious, moral, sincere, dedicated, unregenerate Pharisee, he said, and this is the condemnation that light is coming to the world. Who's the light here? Christ. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Context, I've told you this as long as any of you have sat here in front of me. Context is everything. Who was he speaking to when he spoke these words? He wasn't talking with a bunch of prostitutes. He was not dealing with a bunch of homosexuals. Murderers. Who was he talking to? Nicodemus. A moral, sincere, religious man. And he said, Nicodemus, saying to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, lights, lights standing there in front of him. And he said, men love darkness. What kind of darkness? Religious darkness. Morality, sincerity, kindness, compassion. Nothing wrong with any of that. We should be all those things and more. But to be any of those things, thinking that they make a difference like those Pharisees did, dead works. Fruit unto death. So what did Christ tell him? He told that man, that religious man, it all your religion, all your morality aimed at the ground of salvation, what is it all? It's evil. The most vile of all things. What did he tell them? He told them they were lost. And here's the thing. Christ's doctrine is your doctrine. It's our doctrine. And if they murdered him, they murdered our Lord Jesus Christ, you know, they would murder us except God providentially restrain them. I'll close with this. Blessed are you. Blessed. Eternally blessed. This is part of the Beatitudes now. Blessed are you when men shall revile you 
and persecute and shall say all manner, here's the same word, all manner of evil against you. What do they charge you with? Labor, undertaking, business, employment. But why do they charge us for my sake? And we'll stop right there and we'll come back and pick up verse 5 next week. You're dismissed to worship. I appreciate your presence.